In this episode of Data Framed, a Data Camp podcast, I'll be speaking with Derek Johnson, an epidemiologist with Doctors Without Borders. Derek leverages statistical methods, experimental design, and data scientific techniques to investigate the barriers impeding people from accessing healthcare in Lahe Township, Myanmar. If you thought data science was all machine learning, SQL databases, and convolutional neural nets, this is going to be a wild ride. As to get the data for their baseline health assessments, Derek and his team ride motorcycles into villages in northern Myanmar for weeks on end to perform in-person surveys, equipped with translators and pens and paper, because they can't be guaranteed of electricity. Derek also uses data science to research the factors associated with the transmission of hepatitis C between family members and has helped to conduct studies in Uganda, Nepal, and India. All this and more. I'm Hugo Bound Anderson, a data scientist at Data Camp, and this is Data Framed. Welcome to Data Framed a weekly data camp podcast exploring what data science looks like on the ground for working data scientists and what problems it can solve. I'm your host, Hugo Bound Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bound and Data Camp at Data Camp. You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast. Hi there, Derek, and welcome to Data Framed. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, uh, and it's great to have you on the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I'm excited to be to be on the show today. This is super exciting, and I'm I'm in Sydney, Australia at the moment. Wh- whereabouts are you? So I I am speaking to you from Southern Miramar in a place called Dawei. And are you in are you in an office there, or whereabouts are you? Well, so currently in in Dawei, I'm actually I'm actually in an office. I'm in an office um, that's kind of attached to a to a health clinic. Here in Dawei, I work with Doctors Without Borders, and we have been running um, an HIV clinic out of uh, Dawei for the last eighteen years. Um, so that's kind of where I'm speaking to you from for the moment. Okay, great. So, what else are you doing in Myanmar with, with Doctors Without Borders? Uh, so, so currently we have two projects. So we have the the HIV clinic in Dawei, which has been going, which which has been operational for about eighteen years. But we also recently have kind of opened up a project in northern Miramar um, in, in Nagaland in a town called Lahe. Um, and by comparison, that's, that's only been kind of up and running for about a year now. And we don't necessarily do a lot of HIV up there, but we're kind of basically kind of doing more of like um, supporting the health infrastructure up there and kind of doing more like general health support. Um, so very, very, very different um, than what we do in Dalai. Yeah. Absolutely. So these are two very different projects that that you're involved with. I'd love for you to abstract from that a little bit and let me know or tell us a bit more about your general role at MSF. And for the listeners out there, we'll be referring to Doctors Without Borders as Doctors Without Borders, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and MSF, which is an acronym uh, interchangeably. So hopefully you can, can stick along with that. So Derek, yes, tell us more generally about your role at MSF. Oh uh, yeah, so I, I'm actually uh, currently the the epidemiologist here, um, and so basically I I help out with a lot of operational research and a lot of monitoring and evaluation. And so in in Dawe, where I am right now, we're kind of we're doing um, a bit of uh, operational research on hepatitis C. Uh, we are currently trying to kind of treat people for hepatitis C in Dawe. It, Recently, the price for treatment has, has dropped considerably from tens of thousands of dollars uh, for treatment down to a few hundred dollars to, to treat people. Um, and so here we're trying to kind of like sort of scale up the treatment for hepatitis C because it's actually um, it's 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 kind of it's more prevalent here than in other places in the world. But in Lahe, um, I do um, operational research as well, um, but I do a lot of monitoring and evaluation. So the projects of like our doctors who go to like township villages, we're kind of just sort of monitoring the routine data that they collect there. But we also we also have recently kind of done like a big survey, a big baseline health survey that um, kind of assesses it's 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 township wide representative and it kind of assesses the health of like of several different villages there. Yeah, fantastic. And that's something we're going to get into a a lot later in this conversation. But before that, you said you work as an epidemiologist, which of course involves a lot of statistics and thinking about 
data management, uh, data provenance, all of these types of things. More generally, a lot of a lot of things which intersect with, with with data science. And I'm wondering how you think about data science, how you got into it originally, and kind of what your your path has been to end up in Myanmar working for MSF. Well, so I kind of have a, a, a interesting path to, to data science. Um, so originally, I was actually a, a biochemistry uh, major way, 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 way back in undergrad decades ago. Uh, but I kind of, I kind of realized, I got, I guess, I kind of realized it very, very early, and kind of, I got lucky and realized that working in a lab, while very challenging and and super rewarding, is not very social. There were internships that I worked in where I would, I used to run kind of like a, a mass spec machine, a mass spectrometer, and back in the day, these things were huge like the size of a car. And basically I would just be sitting in a basement and like just the only people I would see would be like occasionally my supervisor, maybe one other person. And that would be for like eight to 10 hours a day. And I was like, I, I can't do this. I have to do something a little more, a little, a little more adventurous. And so I kind of got into public health, but I still wanted to do a lot of science and I still wanted to do a lot of, of research. And so epidemiology is kind of, it's a, it's a great mix. It, you take a lot of data, you take a lot of, and you get to collect a lot of data, which is really fun, but you get to do that kind of in like a, in the field, so to speak. Um, and it doesn't necessarily like, you don't necessarily have to be going to like, you know, the Northern parts of like remote areas um, to do it. Um, you can, you can do it in a clinic. You can do it with like just the data that people collect and then you analyze it. And then you kind of look for patterns or outcomes or how things are associated with uh, one another. And so it's like, it's like puzzle work mixed with like being a little bit of Indiana Jones. And it's, it's great. I love it. I'm, I'm super, super lucky to be able to do this. For sure. And, and how did you actually get involved with MSF originally? Initially, I kind of, I was in grad school um, and I used to do a lot of HIV work um, and STDs in general. And I ended up getting very lucky and getting a chance to go kind of to, to Malawi to look at, uh, initially it was looking at using a HIV drug called tenofovir as a first line HIV drug. And for people who know about antiretrovirals and HIV drugs, that's, that's how, that's how old I am. Like tenofovir became a first line drug, like in the, like 2010 <laughs> in Malawi. So, and that's a long time ago. And so I just kind of got into that and I was like, Hey, this is really great. Like I can, I can do data science. I can, can do my own surveys, collect my own data, analyze it, use a lot of statistics, but then get to travel and get to like meet really interesting, really crazy people and kind of like, and it's just, it was really great. And then from there, when I finished school, I was thinking, well, what to do now? And so I kind of met somebody who actually worked on MSF has refugee boats in the Mediterranean, kind of like off of Italy. And he worked on one of the boats helping like refugees, basically like the boats that would come from Northern Africa with like two, three, 500 people trying to get to Europe. MSF has these boats that kind of help basically just, just bring people in to make sure that they're safe. They don't die. They don't drown. And he said it was the most intense experience he's ever had. And I was like, I'll join that myself. I'll see if I can like kind of look at the data and things they collect. Um, and it turns out that because MSF has operations all over the world, they need a lot of help with data science because that that knowledge that they gain helps form, formulate and help shape their policies. Uh, much in the same way that when you work in a lab, you publish a paper, people are like, oh, this molecule is related to another molecule. We're gonna go with this. Um, and that helps shape science. You get to help kind of shape like health policy of sorts. For sure. And I love that you mentioned, you know, the data collection process is something that you're very passionate about and, and involved in. And that's something we'll get to, particularly with respect to the baseline health assessment you've been doing in, in Lahey Township. Because I think, you know, a lot of working data scientists and a lot of our listeners, when they think about data science and data collection, they think, you know, clicks and browser-based stuff and stuff that's put in a database as opposed to getting there on the ground into remote areas and, and conducting the types of surveys you do. That's a little teaser for where, where we're heading. <laughs> uh, but before we get there, I, I think a lot of people have a sense of what Doctors Without Borders does, but I'd love a brief rundown from you on the work that Doctors Without Borders does from, from your position on the ground. So Doctors Without Borders basically is a kind of an impartial and neutral NGO that provides healthcare to anybody, particularly in humanitarian crises, uh, be that natural disasters um, like earthquakes or typhoons, 
or more like man-made disasters like in like in war zones. Um, they provide humanitarian relief. And so what Doctors Without Borders does is they go to these areas and they basically provide humanitarian aid. And so most of the most of the projects, for example, that I'm part of uh, tend to be very short term. Uh, so before I came to Miramar, I was actually in um, a refugee camp in northern Uganda doing actually a, a, a big household survey on mosquito nets, um, but in the refugee camp itself. So we were just kind of like living there and doing and doing work there. But it was short. I was only there for about four months. And so whereas compared to a lot of development work where they can be in an area, for example, like, like Red Cross or USAID, or there's plenty of development NGOs that can be in an area for, for years, for, for decades. So that's kind of kind of what MSF does is provide humanitarian aid to places and crises. Great. So given that context around what is essentially, you know, a mission statement of, of MSF, what are the biggest challenges that the organization faces that data science and analysis and an- analytics can help to solve? Basically, um, getting to know, I would say, um, in my experience, just getting to know the context of where a health clinic works. And then how do you, how do you take that knowledge and then, and then inform the policies that like bring your, your decisions forward because MSF works in so many different areas in so many different countries, it's, it's critical that they know about the context that they're working in and every place is different. Um, so when I was in Uganda, that is completely different than what I'm doing here now at Miramar. And the people who kind of help decide what to do in terms of like, in terms of projects and in terms of policies, they need as much information as they can get. And so as an epidemiologist, my job is to basically um, do monitoring and evaluation of some of these projects and then putting together kind of like internal reports that people can read and then be like, oh, okay, like, you know, the these people that are taking hepatitis C drugs, for example, maybe 25% of them like don't complete their treatment. What are we going to do about it? Or in the case of like, like when I was in Uganda, we were looking at passing out um, mosquito nets to people in the refugee camp. But the problem with that also is that a lot of times people will try to, will kind of tend to misuse the nets. So a lot of times you'll use it for like fishing. And I didn't know this. I actually didn't know this until I started working there, until we started collecting the data to look at this. A lot of times people, the nets are really strong and they are like, they're just perfect for catching fish. And they're already in like a little basket type shape. <laughs> and you just kind of throw it in the water and like, whoop, and then they're just, they're actually really good for, for fishing, which is a total misuse of the nets. <laughs> so the, the, the survey that we did there kind of helped us form these educational campaigns. Um, and so we would actually go to different parts of the camp and be like, hey guys, don't go fishing with this. Like this is, you know, like to, this is more for mosquitoes. And so it really helped get people to understand like to use the nuts better. And that that's the purpose of the data. So you get the data and that actually helps shape what everybody is going to be doing. Um, and so it's kind of, it's, it's cool in the sense that you actually, if you, if you stick around a project long enough, you actually get to see your results be translated into action, which is something that I, I know when I used to work in the States, sometimes you could publish a paper and you you just never see the results. And then it gets really depressing when you realize that only like three people have cited your paper and you're just like, oh, okay, like what's the point? Yeah, and as I said before, it really seems like data science in 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 this form is so different to what people think of when they think of tech data science, for example. So I, maybe you could speak to the types of differences that are, I think, dominant in your mind with respect to this. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's different. Um, so like, it's funny because the, the statistics um, at its core, the statistics and study design are very, very similar and very much um, kind of the same. And so, which, which I think is like really fascinating that, that you can take your survival analysis or like your logistic regression or your like cluster designs and you can apply it to like schools in England or you can apply it to like villages in like Northern Miramar. But at the same time, um, the data, I, I, I'm getting used to finding messy data and it's smaller data. Uh, so while well, nowadays people are used to having like these gigabyte sized data sets with hundreds and thousands and thousands of observations, sometimes like here, a lot of times you might only get a couple hundred people. And so you're not actually kind of like working with like big data. And then when you have like problems with your variables, 
like if you have a lot of missing variables, for example, you might have to start getting creative and do things like imputation, or you might have to like drop a question in general, um, just be like, oh, it, it didn't quite work out. And so it's, it's, it's very different than using larger data sets. And even the data collection process is very different, right, in terms of what you do when you're running surveys, whether it be with pen and paper, and then putting them into your spreadsheet or computer program or database later. Yeah, um, the collecting the data, um, I I love it. Um, that's that's the fun part. That's the, uh, the the best part of it is that when you actually get to go to the field, um, like for example in Lahe, uh, we actually got to take motorcycles and go from village to village, um, and it was kind of like off roading, like through the mountains of northern Miramar to go to village to village, and then you do these household based surveys when you get there. Um, and so you're like right there to collect the data and see how it's collected and see like what what questions work, what questions don't. And it's it's kind of it gives you a, a better feel of where the data comes from. And then it's kind of a it's it's nice, actually, like that you get to to kind of actually like see the birth of your data for lack. I mean, that sounds sappy, but like <laughs> it's kind of like how your data is. Oh, that's a wonderful. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, probably the most nerdy thing I've ever said. <laughs> you understand the data provenance in in that sense, and you you know what all your units are. It's not like you're being handed a CSV or pinging an API where you may not actually have the correct assumptions about about your data. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, and it's it's interesting. Like I've I've in MSF I've done surveys where we use um, electronic means of data collection. So. I've used both EpiInfo on a smartphone and a program called Dharma. Dharma is a it's it's a service um, that's actually started by an ex MSF staff. She worked in the the Ebola outbreak, uh, not the most not the one that's currently going on, but the one a couple of years ago. And was like, we need better data collection tools. We need like almost real time information about what's going on because things and and outbreaks like Ebola change so fast. And so um, they were actually an epidemiologist and they actually ended up um, just kind of creating this program that allowed for not only data collection, but it also projected um, just trends and statistics on a dashboard and it ended up being, it, it was really good. But at the same time, also like in Lahe, because our teams were out for a week at a time and it was very rural and rugged, uh, we, we resorted to paper-based surveys, which are horrible. I mean, I, I think from here on out, I think I'm just going to have to go the electronic data collection route, <laughs> like because with paper-based surveys, there's no checks and balances. So if somebody puts down, like if you're interviewing somebody and they say their age is really like 10 years old, but you put down 100, there's no like little automatic check that will be like beep, you know, like oh that doesn't make any sense. No testing, no no ability to yeah. test your data. Um, and then also you have to enter the data, which takes double the amount of time. So not only are you collecting the data, but then you have to like get somebody to enter the data, which takes forever. Uh, so electronic data, I'm glad MSF is adopting smartphone tech for like entering and collecting data. It makes things a lot easier. For sure. But as you said, if you're in a region where you may not have access to to electricity for a certain number of days, you know, there are only so many battery packs you can carry, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the problem. Um, and so we it was it was decided finally that because we're spending about a week in the field at a time, uh, so the the Lahe survey uh, went over the course of about two months. And people would go out for a week, come back for a day or two to rest, and then they would, we would go out again for a week. But these are these are areas with no electricity, um, no cell phone coverage for the vast majority of it um, until you start getting to the border of India. And then India has some pretty great cell phone coverage, or at least in that like that region. But you you really just you can't charge your battery pack or your phone. And then if you actually drop phone or something happens to your phone, you lose a whole week of data out of a two week survey process. Um, and it'd be very hard to go back and, and redo it. So we decided to go with with paper surveys, and then we just had like waterproof folders. So it has its pros and cons. I, I tend to be a little more tech oriented, and I was like, "But we could have could have had solar chargers, and we could have had like four battery packs, and then you know we could have gone out for maybe two days at a time." And but that, in the end, we ended up doing paper. For sure. We'll jump right back into our interview with Derek Johnson after a short segment. I'm back here for another installment of Insights from Computational Education with Neil Brown, 
who works as a research fellow in computing education at King's College London. Hi, Neil. Hi, Hugo. So, Neil, a couple of questions that I hear all the time are, can I program? Am I any good at it? And is it all too technical for me? For example, what are your thoughts on these types of questions? Yeah, so a lot of people are interested in whether we can predict success in programming ahead of time. Um, so universities are to be interested in this kind of research because if you can predict who's likely to drop out of your course um, you might sort of not want to take that person on the course um, careers advisors tend to like uh, this kind of thing too you know if you find that certain people say if they like maths or if they're good at maths they're good at programming then they it's a pattern that they can recommend to people so what are the outcomes of these research studies so essentially, like I say, lots of people have looked into it and just none of them have ever really found any strong links where they can predict success in programming based on uh, other factors, whether that's sort of achievement in other subjects, whether it's gender, all sorts of different things. A couple have found uh, some weak associations with things like maths, um, but they often fail to factor out general academic achievement. So if you're good in one subject, you do just tend to be better uh, at other subjects overall. So you have to factor that out if you want to look at pairings between specific subjects. So wait, what you're telling me is that there's nothing that can reliably predict success at programming? No, it doesn't look like it. And sometimes you sort of feel that the researchers doing the studies are a bit disappointed and they maybe see if they can find some sort of statistically significant result uh, to put in their paper. Uh, but I think actually if you just spin that round, it's actually quite a positive message. So there's nothing we've found which we can reliably predict ahead of time whether you're good at programming. So it doesn't matter if you're good at maths or bad at maths. It doesn't matter whether you think of yourself as arty or whether you don't think of yourself as arty. We've no idea whether you'll be good at programming or not. So why don't we just get everyone to try programming and then we'll actually see if they're good at it. Yeah, that's awesome. So I still think there is a general impression out there that some people get programming while others don't. Although we don't know who will actually be good at it, is it right to think that some people are good at it while others flounder? Yeah, so if you've ever done the programming teaching, you may recognize this. You often feel that some people in the class just get it and they're like racing ahead and they're fine. And other people are just really stumped and they just don't seem to get to grips with it at all. Uh, and of course, there's always a performance difference in any subject. So whether it's like, so maths, art or whatever, you always have some who are better at it than, than others. Um, but there is this general opinion that in computing is really split between these two groups of get it and don't get it. Um, so there was a study looking into this where they were interested to see whether computing does or doesn't have a bimodal distribution of uh, marks. So what they did was they came up with some mark distributions and they gave them to computing teachers uh, and said, do you think this is bimodal? And they actually fed them a bunch of unimodal distributions. Um, but when the computing teachers thought it was from a computing class, they were more likely to say this is bimodal than when they thought it was from a class from another subject. Wow. So it seems it's actually in our minds. Yeah, it seems like it might be. Uh, and so not only uh, that result, but if the teacher themselves thought that it was split between some people get it and some people don't, they were more likely to say that the distribution was bimodal. So it seems like it really may be in the minds of the teachers. Wow, great. So a takeaway is that potentially anyone can program and there's no separation between those who magically get it and those who don't. I love it. That's worth bearing in mind. Thanks, Neil. And I look forward to chatting again soon. Yep. Speak to you soon. After that interlude, it's time to jump back into our chat with Derek Johnson. And you very kindly sent me through the study protocol for this baseline health assessment in Lahe Township. And there was so... I was my eyes were stuck to this this PDF while I was while I was reading it. There were so many interesting things in there, um, particularly with respect to the data data collection process. And one thing that stood out to me was that it actually said that the local Nagar dialect is a non written language. So I presume you had translators there who were speaking Nagar to the locals and then writing writing down the data in a different language. Or can, can you just give me the rundown on that? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it, it's it's interesting, and it, it actually comes up a lot when we do surveys in remote areas, um, particularly areas with um, several different languages or different dialects. What kind of uh, ended up happening is we recruited. We had about thirty-four people for this study between the drivers and the data collectors. About about twelve data collectors, and the rest were drivers um, because we had to carry supplies on motorbikes. 
Um, so we actually needed quite a bit of motorbikes to just carry like tents and to carry food and to carry water and things. But so the data collectors themselves were actually recruited like locally and they, they speak Burmese, like they speak, they speak Miramar. But when you get to like parts of Naga land, they actually, they, they kind of like what you were saying. They only, they, they speak like a Naga, Nagamese, which is like a, an umbrella term for a lot of like local village languages. And a lot of these languages don't, are not written down. So the paper surveys themselves were translated into, into Burmese. And the people we hired, they spoke like Burmese, but they also spoke like their own village dialect. And so they'd be speaking their own dialect, but then translating it back to Burmese. And so like, luckily, usually that causes a lot of problems in surveys, particularly if you're acting about complex things or behavioral questions. But this survey was um, a lot of health questions. And so a lot of it was things like, have you been coughing for over two weeks? Yes, no. Is there blood in your cough? Yes or no. Um, so we didn't have to worry too much about the translational differences, but but that does become a problem. Um, that definitely does become quite a problem if you start asking about um, more like sensitive questions. So if you start asking more about um, like in a lot of refugee camps, if you start asking people about like why why did they why did they flee? Like why did they run away? That that's actually quite a different like question, um, and it's open ended, and that requires that you actually you have the proper translator or people speaking the same language as the person you're interviewing. Otherwise your data gets to be a little, a little funky and not representative of what you're doing. Absolutely. So now I'd like to kind of step back a bit and talk about the baseline health assessment uh, project in Lahey Township a as a whole. So maybe you can give us the rundown as to the motivation behind it and how it played out in practice. Yeah. And what, what is it? So um, when MSF decides to open up kind of a new project, they first do what's called like an exploratory mission. So they'll have a couple doctors and a couple uh, logistics people. They'll go to an area and they'll do like a quick assessment to see if there's like any sort of like glaring health needs. So in Lahey, for example, they went up there and they found that the access to healthcare was incredibly poor. Most people couldn't access a health clinic if they wanted to. And at the same time, there was a lot of just um, basic infectious diseases that were going untreated. So... There was this idea to, okay, now that we know that there's this general need, we need to be more specific. And so usually what happens is after an exploratory mission, they'll do kind of like a baseline health assessment, which is a much more formal um, scientific health assessment of like the needs in a particular area. And that, that's kind of where the, the epidemiology kind of comes into play because you end up actually kind of designing a survey to collect the data for that area. And then how to collect, and then what type of information you want to collect. So the baseline health assessment um, had a couple of different parts. Uh, so there's like your basic demographics. There's um, health seeking behavior, like where do you go if you are sick? How often do you go to a doctor? Um, but then there was also um, assessments on malnutrition for children. Um, so we assess uh, the nutritional status of children under five years old, and then we also try to assess uh, vaccination status. And so there's a couple different components to this survey. It was pretty long, but it's a very cursory, very kind of like general overview. So one of the things we found in this, for example, is that there's a lot of respiratory illness. And we, because this is all like just self-reported, um, just things that they, they mention, uh, we try to get to like, what do they think it is? But people don't go to a hospital and there's there's just no way to really tell what it is unless you go to a doctor. So we ask all these questions like about it, but it, it, in the end, it all becomes kind of still like fairly, fairly basic information captured in a very um, specific, like kind of scientific way. And so, for example, for this particular baseline survey, the villages in in Naga, like in Lahe, they're very they're spread out and in the mountains, so it's very clustered. So a village might be an hour and a half drive away from the next village, but really it would only be about like 30 kilometers away. It just takes you a long time because you're literally driving on like a dirt path. Um, and so the problem is, is like within the Lahe Township, there's about 107 villages. Like how, how do you sample enough villages to represent Lahe Township? And then within those villages, how do you sample enough houses to make sure you're actually capturing the information in the village? So you end up with this like two-stage cluster design to your survey, which is pretty pretty neat actually, and it's it's kind of a it's 
it's different than health surveys I've done before. So like in Uganda, it's a big refugee camp and it was split into, well, where we were in Northern Uganda, the, the refugee camp was split into six different parts. And we almost pretty much did like just sort of like random sampling in each of the parts. So we didn't do as much of a clustered survey design. Um, it was a little easier to do. So that's kind of kind of how the, the data collection process happens with that. Um, and it was kind of neat because it, it actually like we, we kind of mixed a little bit of old tech and new tech to this. So the WHO, the World Health Organization, has recommendations for cluster designs dating all of how to sample it dating all the way back to like the, the 70s, where if you you basically when you get to a village and you're trying to randomly select villages, you throw a pen up in the air and then wherever it lands, where that pen is pointing, that's the house you go to. Uh, because they didn't have like all this like <laughs> like smartphones and you know all this tech. And wow. now what we did is it's kind of nuts that you can actually get satellite imagery of different villages in Lahey Township. And so we put that into QGIS, drew the borders around the village, and randomly dropped points into that picture. And then we was like, okay, that point is close to this house. That's the house you're gonna go to. And so we kind of instead of doing the pen method from back in the 70s, we actually did this like GIS way of selecting the households within the village. So it was kind of, it was kind of cool. Actually, it was, it was pretty neat. I got to, to work on some, some GIS work. So, which was pretty good. That's really cool. So how many people are there in Lahey Township and how many villages and how many people did you end up interviewing over what, what time scale? I mean, I've just asked you four questions actually. So that's, that's far too much, but oh, just no. getting kind of <laughs> trying to get a general idea of quantities here. Uh, so it's actually, so uh, Lahey Township is uh, one of three parts of the Nagaland area that's in Miramar. The, the majority of Nagaland is actually over the Indian border, but there's uh, three three sections within like the Miramar side and, and Lahey Township is one of them. And Lahey Township itself, it's, it's in the mountains and there's not a lot of people that live there. There's about, it's about 120,000 people and Lahey Township or Lahey town is kind of the center of it and that's about three thousand people and then there's about 107 villages that are in the township and these villages will move every couple of years so what something we actually had to do that we were told to do beforehand is when we would select a village we actually had to send a team out there to make sure that village was still there and it happened once we selected 30 villages to represent this township it's called ground truthing where you just go out there and you're like okay like does this village exist? Is there enough houses to do this survey? It happened once where a village actually kind of like relocated uh, like a 10, 15 kilometers away because they had water problems. Um, so the stream that was kind of providing water to this village dried up a couple, like a year or two ago. And so everybody sort of just migrated pretty much to find water. And so that's kind of um, kind of the, the context of Lahe is that it's, it's mountainous and it's, it's sparsely populated. The baseline survey itself took about two months. We did it in 30 villages, and we chose those villages based on population size um, or as close to population size as we could get. So we had um, a, basically like kind of a, the size of the village in the Miramar census. And then the chance of being selected in the village, like the village to be selected was weighted on the size. And so, for example, Lahe town itself was chosen twice because it's... Um, it's like got 3,000 people, whereas like the next biggest town we went to had about um, 700 people. And so we chose the 30 villages. And then within each of those villages, we did 30 households. So that's around 900 you surveyed in, in total? Yeah, about, about 900 houses. Um, the average household size came out to be about, about seven people. The like inner quartile range was between five and nine people per household. Um, they do, they, there's a, a common practice of kind of like intergenerational living, like kind of joint families. Uh, so you'll have like, like younger children with the mom and the dad, and then you'll have the grandparents. And sometimes you also have like aunts and uncles that live in a house as well. Uh, so household sizes can be actually quite big. So it ended up being a little over 5,000 people that we would represent. We didn't interview all 5,000. You just took one, one member of the household and then just asked questions about everybody to that one person. That way you'd, not everybody had to be present. How do you choose which member of the household? It, it actually came down to like a little bit of like um, cultural acceptance. So usually it was like kind of like the the father of the household uh, or like kind of like the, the male figure. 
a lot of times though, people, people do a lot of um, agricultural work. And so if it was kind of in the middle of the day, a lot of people would already be out in the field. So what ended up actually happening more often than not was a lot of times we, we did get a lot of like uh, female household heads that would answer for the survey. Um, we also got a lot of grandparents that kind of answered for the survey. Um, the only requirement really to, to kind of be considered a head of household was that you had to be over 18 and you had to have been able to answer questions for everybody in the household. Uh, so that, that was the only inclusion criteria to be kind of deemed the, the head person to answer the survey. How are the insights that are gained from this baseline health assessment turned into actionables and deliverables for MSF? Currently, actually, uh, because we found a lot of respiratory illness with this survey, we're actually helping to put in a, a what's called like a gene expert machine in Lahey Township Hospital. And so it's a, it, it, to help to test for tuberculosis. So the kind of like the old school way of testing for TB is you hack up your lungs and like, <laughs> and then you spit your sputum onto a slide and then you stain it and then you put it on a slide and you have to have like a trained health professional to kind of like look at that slide and be like, oh, that's your microbacteria. Like, you know, it, that's, that's, you have TB, <laughs> like, um, which is, which is not very sensitive or specific. It's, it's got like a sensitivity specificity of like, like in the fifties or sixties. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty crap. But with this technology, the gene expert machine, it's it's highly accurate, and it basically can give you test results in a couple hours. But we would it's expensive, um, and it requires a bit of like a, like like a constant electrical supply. And we wouldn't have put it in unless we knew that there was a high amount of of respiratory illness within the area. And is this type of actionable developed from the insights gained from the health assessment similar to other projects at MSF? For example, your, your work in Uganda in the refugee camp? Oh, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty similar. So um, uh, a lot of the, the operational research MSF does, it's all geared towards doing actionable results. So, so in Uganda, one of the surveys we did was on mosquito net use because there's a lot of malaria. Um, at the time. And malaria is um, cyclical. So when, when the rainy season kind of came about, that's when you would see spikes in malaria. And so we did this uh, assessment on bed net use right before the rainy season, be like, hey, does everybody have bed nets? Or do you, how do you use bed nets? And then the results from that kind of led to a mass mosquito net distribution and also the educational campaign to make sure you're using mosquito nets right. Um, so we ended up actually a couple months after the survey ended up actually passing out a whole bunch of mosquito nets. Um, it, it ended up being close to like 13, 14,000 mosquito nets for the area, which is, it's, it's a great way to see your data in action. Um, and it's, it's, it's great. That's probably like the, the, the number one thing I like uh, about uh, doing epidemiology for, for MSF is that you get to, if you're lucky and you stick around long enough, you get to see your results turn into something actionable. So Derek, something I've been thinking a lot about recently is how we don't necessarily have good models for, or we haven't settled on, you know, uh, a, a global model for how data scientists, statisticians, statistical modelers are embedded in organizational structures and businesses. So I'm wondering how, you know, data science is embedded in, in the organizational structure of MSF. Data has always kind of been there in, in forms of like, um, kind of like internal reports, but the operational research aspect of it is, is actually kind of somewhat new. And it's, it's, it's funny because you can kind of look at, bef like in the early days, um, the MSF never really kind of like published a lot of like scientific data, but then all of a sudden there's actually kind of became like two big data, data hubs in MSF. So there's Epicence in Paris, which is like a big repository of a lot of the data that MSF collects. And they also provide a lot of support when it comes to designing various studies, um, just in terms of like study design. And then there's the Mason unit in England, um, which does the same thing. Um, the Epizons tends to focus a lot on the French speaking countries and, and the Mason unit tends to take a lot of the English speaking countries. But these are two big data repositories. So MSF has actually become quite, quite serious in the last like five to seven years, more more like seven years on how data is, is pretty much the best way to, to inform your policy decisions. It's, it's hard to argue with the numbers. Um, and, and before, especially with a lot of the work that MSF does, a lot of it can be a little controversial and a lot of it can be quite risky. Um, so when you have like the hard science and the hard numbers and data there, um, that it adds a lot of weight to your, to your policy decisions. 
for for example, with the Ebola crisis that happened a couple of years ago, it was very very important to have kind of real time data of where cases were clustering because that's where you would send your health workers, um, not just your doctors, but like educational people. So like your health promoters to be like, oh, like if somebody is bleeding, like don't you know bring them to a doctor, but like don't don't like touch the blood and you know, like you, it's a good way to prevent the transmission of, of Ebola, but you had to do that fairly fast because uh, like Ebola, like the, the incubation time was only a handful of days. Um, and then the more like it, it, the mortality like rate of it, it actually would kill people in, in about two weeks time. So you had to act really fast. And so the data that you collected was the best way to inform your decisions. Otherwise you'd just be arguing over what, you heard from people in the village at the time, and it would take take forever to do something. We'll jump right back into our chat with Derek after a short segment. Now it's time for a segment called Blog Post of the Week. I'm here with Emily Robinson, a data scientist on the growth team here at Data Camp. Hi, Emily. Hi, Hugo. Thanks for having me on. I want to share a great post from Mikhail Popov on the difference between data scientists and data analysts. These titles are common in industry, but there's not a clear, agreed-upon definition of each and how they differ from each other. So Mikhail put out a call on Twitter to ask his followers what they thought. He got over 30 responses, and this post summarizes the main themes. So what themes did Mikhail see emerge in the responses? Well, one is that data scientists are data analysts who can code. This viewpoint takes into account that graphical user interfaces, or GUIs, such as Excel, limit what you're able to do. When you program in a language like R or Python, you greatly expand the breadth of problems you can solve. So I like this distinction a great deal and and think it's a good one to keep in mind. It actually reminds me of Hadley Wickham's talk, you can't do data science in a GUI. Right. Another view is that the ability to do machine learning is a differentiator. While not all data science projects require machine learning, being a data scientist does require that skill set. Oh, this is an interesting one that I think is valid, but that I also disagree with, particularly as I don't always think the distinction between machine learning and statistical modeling is all that useful. If anything, I'd personally reframe this distinction as data scientists understand enough mathematics to be able to build robust models, whether they be called statistical models or machine learning models. But maybe that's semantics. (laughs) What other distinctions did Mikhail see emerge? Well, finally, instead of focusing on data analysts versus data scientists, one can distinguish between type A and type B data scientists. A stands for analysis. Type A data scientists have strong statistics skill and the ability to work with messy data and communicate results. B stands for build. Type B data scientists have very strong coding skills and focus on putting machine learning models, such as recommendation systems, into production. Yeah, I I like this different formulation of the question and actually uh, had a great discussion about the differences between type A and type B data scientists with you, I think, on the podcast when you appeared last, and maybe even with Robert Chang. He's definitely, definitely written about it anyway. What then are some practical considerations for a company when choosing a title? Great question. This was also addressed in this post. And full disclosure, I'm the one who replied with these thoughts. At least for the New York and San Francisco tech scene, data scientist roles command a higher salary. You also may lose talents if you have the data analyst title. People care about titles and data scientists is generally seen as more prestigious. If someone finds a similar role at another company, that has the data scientist title, they may prefer that role. That's interesting. So how are different companies handling this? Many big tech companies, including Spotify and Facebook, are shifting away from data analyst titles to data scientists. Lyft actually just wrote a post about their decision to do this. They also changed their data scientists to research scientists. In some cases, they'll add a specialty after the data scientist title. For example, Airbnb currently has openings for data scientist, comma, analytics, data scientist, comma, algorithms, data scientist, comma, inference, and more. This way, you can have data scientists as a big umbrella term, just as software engineer is, while specifying in the title and job description what aspect of data science they'll work on. Oh, this has been a great discussion, Emily. What should our listeners take away as the core conclusion? 
I really liked Miguel's closing thoughts. He emphasizes that while this shows there's no one agreed upon definition, having that is not necessarily the goal anyway. Rather, it's to make sure to be specific when writing a job description and not assume the title is self-explanatory. I would also add it's good for job seekers to remember to cast their net widely and not just look for positions with data scientist as a title. You may find roles you're interested in that are called product analyst, business analyst, machine learning engineer, or more. Thanks, Emily. And I look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks, Hugo. Time to get straight back into our chat with Derek Johnson. So something you mentioned earlier was that you see more and more uh, abilities for tech to be used in the work MSF does and th- the type of surveys you, you've been doing. What else is there in the future of data science at MSF, which which isn't there or hasn't been discussed in this conversation? Well, so something that, um, that I kind of want to see be used a little more, particularly when it comes to health promotion, um, and something that I'm trying to, I'm kind of like playing with a little bit is um, network analysis. So like social network analysis, particularly for, for health promotion, um, in addition to outbreak, um, outbreak epidemiology, which is, it, that's kind of what most people think about when they think about like a network analysis and, and infectious disease. But it's also a great way to find who in a community has the most influence and who do you really want to target with like your health promotion behaviors? So if you're trying to kind of get people to like, like something fun and something silly, like, like brush your teeth more, who do you really want to talk to the most? Like, do you want to talk to the children? Do you want to talk to the moms or maybe, maybe it's the grandparents that happen to have like the most sway. And by doing like a network analysis, you can see who has the most connections and then you can see the strengths of those connections. And rather than like target an entire village and be like, Hey, everybody brush your teeth and have like a big, like rock concert on it. You can just target like a handful of people knowing that they would spread the message to a good chunk of the community. So it almost hurts me to say this, but what we're looking for are influencers, right? This is influencer culture. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of, it's um, instead of taking like um, like the influencers of like fashion and stuff, you can kind of give it like a like a little bit of a health bend and be like, all right, like maybe, maybe if this like the cool guy like would to brush his teeth in public, maybe he has the biggest influence. But like it's getting to like know who has these influences in a way that it's really hard to do with traditional data collection methods. Um, so you can find like with a lot of, you know, like odds ratios and P values and just, you can find the strength and magnitude of associations for like one variable and another, but you can't really tell like, okay, like that's, that's just the relation between those things, but like what outside of it influences those factors as well. For sure. And I, I like the idea that you're thinking about um, network theory and network analysis in, in this respect, because as you were saying, network analysis is thought about a lot in terms of infectious epidemiology, but we know that it has a huge role to play in even non-infectious epidemiology. You know, I think one of the one of the common examples is people don't contract obesity from each other, but if you have a network um, and you're connected to more people with obesity, there you've got a higher likelihood of having it yourself at some point. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that, that's actually a really great, great example of it is that, um, yeah, like obesity um, and dietary habits are greatly influenced uh, by your friends and network. I, I can definitely speak for experience. Um, I used to, to smoke cigarettes for about like six years, seven years, um, and all my friends smoked cigarettes. And it wasn't really until I kind of like moved from, I grew up in Boston, but um, moved from Boston to um, Philadelphia, I just got like an t- entirely new friend circle where nobody smoked and everybody was healthy. And I was like, huh, maybe I should quit smoking. But I mean, if I never, if I never changed my friend circle, I'd, I'd still be smoking two packs a day. So we haven't talked much about, um, you know, the technical technical stuff that that we love so much. You you did mention that for sampling, you do a two stage uh, cluster sampling methodology. We've also been discussing network analysis, but. I'm wondering what's one of your favorite data science techniques or methodologies. So just something you love to do when playing with data. Oh, that's a good, that's a great question. That's really good. I don't want to, I don't want to sound lame and kind of basic, but logistic regression, right on. I know that's like super simplistic, <laughs> like, yeah, like, but like odds ratios are great because everybody understands them. They're easy to calculate and you'd be surprised how much data you can get with a binary response. 
you just like, you know, like, do you like mangoes? Yes, no. Like, do you use condoms? Yes, no. Like, you know, do you, are you an injection drug user? Like, did you go to a doctor last week? Yes, no. But like, you know, like anything that's kind of like binary. And then by extension, you can do multivariate logistic regression type. No, I'm not too blanking on the term here. Um, but basically, you, you can also do like odds of things with more than more than a binary set. You can do it with like different levels of categories as well to get different odds. Um, but that that works out really well, actually, when you um, not only like collect and analyze data, but when you present it. So if, if data science is really going to kind of like lead the way in helping to change health policy in this case, you have to be able to kind of communicate your results to people who might not be as minded. So while I can get into like coding about like R and show, you know, all this like data management and things, and it's great and I, I love it. Like I know um, the project coordinator for Lahe, for example, that doesn't like it at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> and unless you can like kind of put it in a graph, like their attention span kind of wanes after like three minutes. And so, yeah, log logistic regression is probably a, a great way to communicate a lot of results. In my in my experience, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree completely. And as and, you know, I've said this time and time again on on the podcast. But for people who are non technical, you can show them that a ten percent increase in this feature results in this probability in, in in the outcome. And in that sense, it's interpretable, which exactly. gives you massive gains. In yeah, and then, exactly. And it, it's um, and that's that 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 like kind of what you just said is like a, a great way to just explain it um it's it's short easy to understand you know just something like that like the odds of this risk factor increasing your risk of contracting hiv are such and such however like kind of behind the scenes is like the way you sample the way you collect that data to make sure like your analysis is correct um and that gets to be quite complicated um, for example, the, the two stage cluster design thing using like randomly like assigned GPS points, that's, that's somewhat complicated and it, it takes a little bit to do, but in the end, you kind of like, you try to distill it down to things everybody can kind of digest. So Derek, my last question for, for you is, do you have a final call to action for all our listeners out there? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess I'm a little different than a lot of people that, that come on this podcast in the sense that I don't always use massive data sets, um, or I'm not always kind of like crunching out numbers and very clean data. But at the same time, like, I think, I think people should get into data science and get into kind of more, more field work out there. Um, there's definitely a place for people to get out of the office, collect their own data, analyze it, and then actually have like actionable results. Um, and so don't let the fear of sitting in a cubicle somewhere, just pumping out code dissuade you from doing data science. Data science is for everybody. Fantastic, Derek. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. This is great. Uh, I had a real fun time. Really good. Thanks for joining our conversation with Derek about his work with Doctors Without Borders. We saw the unique challenges encountered on the ground by Derek and his colleagues in performing baseline health assessments in Laha Township, Myanmar. These range from small sample sizes to the need for robust experimental design to basic challenges in the data collection process, which we don't really think about in tech. Practical challenges such as lack of electricity forcing surveys to be conducted with pen and paper, the unique problem of working in non-written languages and riding motorcycles to nomadic villages that have moved by the time you get there. We also saw that insights from such baseline health assessments are turned into actionables, a paradigm of this being the following. Because with this survey, they found a lot of respiratory illness, they're putting in gene expert machines at Laha Township Hospitals, which will help to test for tuberculosis. Make sure to check out our next episode, a conversation with Max Kuhn about data science in the pharmaceutical industry in general and at Pfizer in particular. Max was Senior Director of Non-Clinical Statistics at Pfizer for over 10 years, is now a software engineer at R Studio, creator of the Carrot Package for Machine Learning in R, a data camp instructor, and an open source beast. He's also hilarious. What do data science and statistics at Pfizer even look like? What is non-clinical statistics? And what are the biggest challenges in pharma that data science can help to solve? All this and more next week. I'm your host, Hugo Bound Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bound and DataCamp at DataCamp. 
You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast. <laughs>